Hello, and welcome to I Dream in Black and Gold, with me, Joseph Eklund. Today I wanted to look out into the possible futures. And in the same way we might look back at and say to someone who was a slave or a slave master, or just someone who didn't own slaves, but didn't consider a world without slavery. When we think about these kind of people, it's kind of hard for us to imagine what the worldview was like, what it was like to just consider that humans could be property of other humans, that people can explain things away to that extent where they will violently oppress and chain and kidnap and create legal structures to maintain that social order. order. In a similar way, if someone from a future society came back and talked to us and asked us how we could think that unconsented authority, not just in slavery, but in unconsented government, in involuntary statism, how that would just be an absurdity to them, and yet we explain it away. I have explained it away. I no longer would do that. But how the majority of the people on Earth today would explain away this classism, this true uh, classism, where certain people have the right to give away the inalienable rights of others that so we have in the wider spectrum of society have accepted this to be the case. I know that there was a an animation out on YouTube that is a wonderful illustration of this. It was based on a talk by uh, Larkin Rose, excellent um, reasoner and anarchist that has an alien comes to Earth and first person the alien comes across says, whoa, an alien! And he says, should I bring you to our leader? And the alien is like, what's a leader? And the human's like, well, the one in charge, the person who makes the rules who is the leader of the people, and they have this sort of Socratic discussion in order to describe to the alien what leader is, what government is, and the alien is just confounded, like, there, you have somebody in charge of you? Like, there's a person in charge of everything? There's, is this a different species? What, what is this government? And he's like, well, it, it's over there in the Capitol building. He's like, oh, is it a building? No, it's these politicians. Well, are the politicians a different species? No, they're just people. But why do they have superior rights to other people? They're still the same species. Is Are they really smart? And just, are they, you know, oh, well, that's the great thing about democracy is we get to choose our leaders and aliens, the alien asks, you know, is this, do they end up being, I would assume if, if you get to choose them, that they're the wisest and uh, most ethical uh, people in order to have this great responsibility to make your decisions for you. <laughs> and of course, being a standard human, well, actually they're mostly lying crooks who tend to exploit our natural resources and and give privileges away that that ruin our lives and our environment and 
Huh. Alien doesn't really get it. It's an absurdity to him. Her. It. I didn't really have a gender. But it had a sort of masculine voice, just because of the actor who played his voice. So, in a similar way, and I'll provide a link to that in uh, the description, as well as a number of others uh, links, because we have great um, works of science fiction that explore the ideas of future societies that have rejected this idea of statism. Uh, some of the big ones that come to mind are Verna Vinja, who uh, wrote in his series uh, Mer uh, Across Real Time about how as we approach the singularity where humans and technology meet, um, it becomes really impractical. Like, you can't govern people because they have whole masses of robot armies that do their bidding for them and everyone's like has the same amount of power over each other so that it just doesn't really work um and of course it's set into this really cool um uh murder mystery um but actually that's just marooned in real time there's actually a short story so so the whole series across real time is three stories first book is called The Peace War, which I actually haven't read. It's on my uh, soon-to-read list, because I, I read the last one um, kind of first, and discovered uh, this story, and it's really great. Um, but in The Peace War, a technology comes out um, that's totally beyond... Um, the rest of humanity and the people who have this technology which actually creates a impenetrable bubble around anything that you basically aim it at it becomes this gun um they end up they have great humanitarian thoughts and they want to create a better society and so in the name of peace the peace authority marches on the world and basically takes it over using this advanced weaponry and then the uh, tinkerers, pe normal people in their garages, in you know, in hiding, figure out the technology and um, break apart the peace authority um, to give autonomy to people in their regions. I once again, I haven't read that, um, so it's on my list. And then. The second story is actually a very short story. It was uh, put out in a series of short stories by Werner Vinja, and it is called the Un the Ungoverned. And the Ungoverned is actually talking about an area of the Midwest of America, where it is practically anarchy. The protection services are provided by uh, agencies that are in working with insurance companies. They want to lower crime so that they can lower their rates to compete with uh, other insurance companies. And it's about a small, a relatively small time uh, detective and protection agency. Um, and it just shows the working of this in a practical, like, life, real life seeming story. It really seems like, yeah, these are real people. They make real decisions and, and it's practical. And what happens is a neighboring state invades territory or property of uh, some clients of this, of this protection agency. And so how do they work with that? They're, co they're contracting, um, how they work with um, larger organizations to give them backup in order to defend themselves against uh, the state that's invading. And of course, there are people who aren't their clients in the same geographical area, 
people who are isolationists. They, they're hermits and all these sorts of things. Really interesting story. And it's mainly just sort of a standalone example in this same time, timeline of how this could work. And it's very much a, a, a novella of the machinery of freedom. And then the last book, which I really enjoyed, uh, is called Marooned in Real Time, which really gives the uh, title to the series Across Real Time. Because it ends up that, and pro they probably figure this out in the Peace War, that these uh, impenetrable bubbles that they shoot at people are actually freezing time. And they learn to control it, and it's basically a one-way passport to the future. So you pop yourself into one of these bubbles, and you're immediately in another uh, future time, and... All that's happened is that this bubble is suddenly occupied space, and nobody can mess with it. It might get buried, and you might end up uh, coming out if you are uncareful, if you're not very careful about where you are and how long you freeze time. You might find yourself in underground or something if you were under for like a few hundred thousand years, which happened because um, when they were experimenting, they didn't have much control of how long they were frozen in time. But at some point in the 22nd, no, 23rd century, I think it was, humanity disappeared. And there's all these different theories about um, why humanity disappeared. And the different characters that are in the book are people who have been closer and closer to the singularity, um, so to speak. They've become more and more technologically advanced, and they, for differing circumstance, they decided to take a jaunt into the future. Maybe they were evading a cop, um, or, you know, there's a couple thieves and stuff like that that wanted to evade their circumstance of, going, of dealing with the justice of... Uh, their actions. There were others, of course, that had the mistakes um, regarding the technology, and others that um, just wanted to see. They they actually there were characters that just you know spend a few days in each time. They would just want to observe uh, humanity evolving, and suddenly humanity disappears. And so they start collecting all these people to restart humanity. And, of course, these, there are statists from the Republic of New Mexico. There are, um, but very shortly after the Peace War, it became pretty obvious to most of humanity that statism is barbaric. And so most, all the advanced technologists uh, understand that it's immoral and doesn't make sense. And they actually have some moral dilemmas because they have such advanced technology that there's a certain natural statism that happens and they're and they and it works with their character dilemma um, in the midst of this there is a murder that a detective is trying to figure out and he's not the most advanced technologically so he has to get some uh, some explanation from the more advanced humans really interesting story and really good questions about um, how humanity is going to evolve, how we merge with technology, or do we become energy beings, or what, you know, people traveling to other galaxies or solar systems, etc., to uh, find alien life. Really a great book. Werner Vinja, The Peace War, The Ungoverned. The Ungoverned you can find online for free um, as a PDF. I would be interested in producing a, just a reading for it. Maybe I'll produce it on YouTube if, if that would be acceptable for, by the author. Um, and then the uh, Marooned in Real Time. Marooned in Real Time is the third story. So that was one of the uh, early books that I read that was explicitly uh, anarchist.
as far as fiction. Um, the first book by Robert Heinlein that I read was Stranger in a Strange Land. And there is individualistic themes and some sense of uh, anarchism in that book, but it's more spiritual and it's definitely an interesting read. If I would recommend Stranger in a Strange Land to anyone just because it pushes the boundaries. Um, but the book that I just listened to as an audiobook, um, and I found it on YouTube and just listened to it for, what, 12 hours, um, that's by Heinlein that is explicitly um, promoting anarchism in uh, various ways is The Moon is a Harsh Mistress. Now, many um, people know this book, and if you don't know it, um, I would suggest reading it. It is really interesting and fun, and it's sort of a celebration of the dream that was the American Revolution, but brings it to its natural conclusion, at least with one character being the rational anarchist, um, a professor who is sort of the uh, intellectual father figure to the whole book. Now, as far as I understand, it was not fully successful. It did not bring a fully anarchist society, but you can tell that they're moving in that direction. And it's just the nature, the natural social norm on Luna, the moon, uh, that is much more of an individualistic and anti-authoritarian uh, social uh, culture. So the story in The Moon is a Harsh Mistress is that, uh, obviously, the moon, being the harsh mistress, um, it, it has been colonized as a penal colony. The Earth world government, basically, it's a federated nations of, of Earth, have, for the most part, done away with the death penalty and have taken all, the, all those capital punishments and exported those criminals to the moon. And this was generations ago. Since then, they still send uh, prisoners to the moon, but there are also children of prisoners um, and free people and immigrants to the moon. And there is no independent law. There is law in the sense that they have a warden um, or a keeper of the peace, but all of the uh, Luna population basically calls him the warden and he can make rules and uh, use his tr bodyguards and his troops to enforce those rules but for the most part Luna is a uh, relatively free market society outside the fact that its exports and imports to and from Earth are highly regulated and controlled, price controls, etc. And they're, they have different monies that they use, one of them being the Hong Kong dollar of the Hong Kong area of the moon. It's different cities that are a little bit confusing, but the Hong Kong uh, dollar is loosely pegged to gold, I think, whereas the authority dollars are the ones used by, um, I think, I think they're used by the Earth and the Moon Authority, but it might just be the Moon Authority being the warden and such. But in any case, the the trade of they they grow lots of crops under the Moon using their power. They have lots of land, and the Earth is getting crowded and they can produce much more using controlled environment. So they produce a lot of food for the Earth and, and use the low gravitational escape that the Moon has to send cheap shipments down. The hardest thing is uh, 
it's getting certain resources back. But in any case, um, the main character, uh, Manny, uh, is a computer techie who he he's a troubleshooter and he works with the central computer of the moon colony and he hasn't told anyone but he's pretty sure that the computer itself has become self-aware to the point of actually uh, appreciating humor and analyzing humor and and it even uh, says that it's lonely and wants to talk to not stupid people. And Manny ends up kind of by accident, he's a practical guy, not political, um, ends up at a anti-authoritarian rally where the Lunas want to be independent of the authority. They want to be their own nation. And he ends up becoming friends with a woman, a rabble rouser, and they have discussions and he's like, hey, she's not stupid. So maybe I'll introduce her to my friend, Mike, the computer. I'm not sure why his name is Mike, maybe Manny named him Mike. But they start to realize that having the central computer of the lunar colony as a friend could be an invaluable asset to the revolutionary cause. And this sort of gives them the possibility of independence. Um, this combined with um, the intellectual guidance of the professor, and I forget his last name, who is a rational anarchist. He is sort of the philosophical um, guide and strategic guide to the revolution. Between him um, and between the three of these and Mike the computer, they can run statistical analysis of how to uh, achieve success and and it experiences the difficulty and the complex, the complexity of um, achieving freedom. Another thing about uh, Robert Heinlein is that he's not only pushing the boundaries of, of intellectual thought about uh, the state, but he's also working with boundaries of how we have different social relationships other than the state. Things like uh, religion, marriage, etc. Um, marriage specifically, he spends a lot of time with, where he explores different um, different forms of polygamy, um, different ways that the genders interact, and on the moon, in the moon is a harsh mistress. One of the practical questions of life is that because it was a penal colony there were 10 times as many men as there were women and um and it was easy to kill people by sticking them in an airlock and ejecting them now what did that do of course during this the time time of the book the ratio is more like two to one but still the cultural effect of this is that women were actually, they were not, like, you might think that since there were less of them that they'd be, you know, oppressed and that the men would exploit them, but no, that doesn't really make sense because men tend to become aggressive with one another if, if they love a woman and the women basically started to make all the rules and if you didn't treat a woman right the men would get together and they'd throw you out an airlock 
because we have a natural tendency to want to protect women. And sure, there is the occasional rapist, there is the occasional aggressor, but for the most part, the women made all the rules about romance. The women started having uh, polyandrous um, marriages where there would be many men, and they could divorce a man whenever they wanted. Um, but it actually started happening more and more where a woman would have more than one man and she would have a lot more resources. So this is, this is an interesting exploration. Manny himself actually is a uh, proud advocate of a line marriage. And a line marriage is an interesting uh, social arrangement where... Um, say there's a married couple and say, you know, they got married when they were uh, 18 and 16, you know, they were younger. And as they got older, they wanted to, um, well, for one, the woman might, or the man might want another partner. And as long as they were all consensual, they would, uh, unanimously uh, vote to marry another person. Now what Manny's family had done for like a hundred years is they had married alternately a man, a woman, a man, a woman, just to keep things in balance, keep things, um, you know, even. And what this had done what was it concentrated the economic value and it created stability uh, for uh, the children and the social environment. The emotional um, work was not put on one woman, which is often the case with um, our relationships today, is that men are not as emotionally communicative, and so they rely on women for their emotional uh, communication. And women want other women to talk to, and so that's a wonderful thing if they can um, be so open and loving with one another that they aren't um, jealous in a certain respect. And same thing with men. Men then aren't having to support a whole family themselves, but they can be um, co-husbands and, and support the family together. And they tried, in Manny's case, they tried to keep everything very well balanced. As far as age differences, there was, you know, like, like almost a 60 or 70 year um, span of the different spouses. Not in between them, but um, as far as a, the spectrum, you know, it's a grandmother in, or not grandmother, oh, well, she is a grandmother, but um, the big mama uh, wife in her 80s and the youngest wife, our husband, who's basically uh, like 18 or even 16, because it was also socially acceptable on, on the moon, because especially women um, are so venerated that as soon as they become uh, sexually active or, or interested, they basically have autonomy and nobody can control them because they get their say and, and, and all the men would would protect their uh, say, would enforce that uh, social norm. You know, social norms tend to be re self reinforcing. So anyway, it's a really interesting book, um, and I would love to explore some of these others. But I'll put a, a link to the audiobook and maybe even some discussions about that book as well. I hope that this has piqued some interest and uh, gets some discussion going. I don't know about polygamy, it, it, especially not the forms like one man, many women, well that just doesn't make any sense. But um, having sort of clan marriages or line marriages or something, it's an interesting thought, at least a nice thought experiment. Um, Something to talk about as we evolve in our social groupings and develop empathy in a more practical way where um, we're not so afraid of a lot of these 